Great, OK, I think I'm going to start then. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, so my name is Scott Laurie. I'm the co-director of iNaturalist, which I'll kind of talk at length about. But it's a joint initiative of the California Academy of Sciences, which is a natural history museum, and the National Geographic Society. Um, and one of the things we're really interested in with iNaturalist is how you come up with, with systems that have elements of machine learning, but also elements of crowdsourcing, and sort of how do you combine you know, machines and humans into sort of a healthy ecosystem to solve problems. So um, I'm going to sort of talk about the uh, iNaturalist is a case study for this, it really with this focus on this environmental problem that we're trying to solve. And then Feder is going to come up and talk about um, Amazon SageMaker and Ground Truth, which is really a set of tools that Amazon has to, to really help with this process, particularly the, the labeling part. Um, but just to start, I wanted to just give a quick kind of overview of what, what iNaturalist is. So iNaturalist is the world's largest citizen science site. And I don't know if any of you guys have heard about the term citizen science. But really what we're trying to do is say, you know, is there science that we could do that we couldn't do on our own, just as, as scientists? That we, we have to, the only way we can do the science is to get lots of people around the world engaged in doing this work. And similarly, can we really engage people in you know, this lifestyle of actually contributing to science? And so in many ways, the kind of basic activity with iNaturalist is you're out on a hike, and you see a frog, and you're curious what that frog is, and you take a picture of it. And the app will tell you what it is. It will say, this is a tree frog, and you'll learn more. But at the same time, you're actually creating data and uh, contributing that to the system that's sort of learning and this kind of big network that's trying to understand this stuff. Um, but I think one of the things that sets our naturals aside is that we really come, we're not a for-profit company. We're this joint initiative between two nonprofits, you know, Natural History Museum and the National Geographic Society. And we're really coming at this from a sort of a scientific and uh, environmental mission standpoint. And this was an article that was in, um, it was all over the place. Uh, this is the Washington Post um, last month. But this is the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Systems. And their conclusion is that in the next 100 years, we're going to lose about half of all species. So there's 2 million species right now that have names. And we're going to lose one half of them in the next 100 years. And this is a sort of double whammy of climate change, you know, shifting species around and land use change, deforestation, all these pressures kind of coming down at once and very, very quickly. A lot of these things, species have dealt with over mill millions of years, you know, glaciations and things, but this happened over thousands of years. And this is all going to happen, and it's happening now, but it was really the cycle of it happening is, is the next 100 years. And all of these reports, this was a big UN report, they always have the same conclusions, that to, to, if we really want to confront this challenge, we need to do two things. We need information on where these species are so that we can take our scarce conservation resources and apply them. So we need to know, you know, of, of these two million species, which ones are we losing this year? Where are they shifting? What's happening? Some are exploding and becoming invasive species that are having all sorts of weird impacts. Other ones are sort of receding away and going extinct. We need information to sort of see this stuff so we can make good decisions. But we also need a public that cares. If we had all this data, but we didn't have an engaged, you know, grassroots community of constituents who actually cared about this stuff, it's not going to make any difference. So that's what I love about citizen science is that it really has the opportunity to do both of these things at once. It engages the public, gets them involved, which I think is a big problem with science is that it doesn't really engage the public. But also, it allows us to do science that we couldn't do on our own. And, and my background is just sort of traditional environmental science. Um, and you know, most of my work was taking little tags and putting them on animals. So I did a master's where we put little radio tags on birds, and that would allow us to track the birds and release them. So we get a sense of where these birds are moving and you know, how the deforestation is affecting them and which ones are going extinct. And then I did my PhD sort of putting larger tags on things like elephants and buffalo and lions so we could get them moving around. But again, increasingly realized that there's just not enough of us to go out and put these tags on these animals to understand what's going on. <laughs> we need more help. And also that, um, you know, again, this is just isn't involving the public. If you have us scientists just working in isolation, the public has no sort of grasp on what, what this is doing. So this really, again, led me to this idea with citizen science, where we can try to do both of these together. So the basic core with what iNaturalist is doing, it's kind of like I explained a second ago. Someone's out on a hike. They see a butterfly. They're curious about it. They want to learn more. They take a picture of it and send it. And we have this big online community, which gets into the sort of ground truth SageMaker thing of people that are sort of discussing and identifying this stuff to try to turn this image into a labeled piece of data, right? And it's really not just labeling. I mean, this is, it's a social network. So there's a lot of really deep social interaction that's happening on this. And then once we have you know, a labeled image, we know, wow, this butterfly was this species. It was here at this point in space and time. And we can do some kind of interesting science and make some cool discoveries. 
I just wanted to give th three kind of fun examples of some of the more neat discoveries that were made over the last couple of years. So this is one from, a, I think it was, this was like two years ago. And this is a kind of a neat story where a guy was on vacation in Vietnam. So he was on this beach on this beautiful island in Vietnam, and he saw this snail, and he took a picture of it, and he posted it to iNaturalist. And then there was a, a macologist who is a scientist who studies snails. He was the world's expert on these Vietnamese snails. He said, I, I know this snail. I, I know this snail. This snail has never, ever been collected. There are no, uh, so there's no photos of it. There's no collections of it, but it was drawn once. And it was drawn on one of the Captain Cook expeditions that went around the world. So Captain Cook's boat, you know, in like the, I don't know, 1700s, they stopped in this island, they drew this snail, and you know, it's just a snail guy would know that this is a big charismatic snail. It's like, I know that snail, you know? But uh, again, so this is a cool discovery, and the probability of that person on that beach seeing the snail, knowing what it is, is pretty much zero. But if we can create this ecosystem to connect people and connect this expertise, that's what this is all about. Um, this is one from February or March of this year, which I thought was kind of cool. So this is in Santa Barbara. This guy, um, uh, Tom Lee Turner, was out with a bunch of school kids on a beach in Santa Barbara, and they saw this big ocean sunfish, which is called a mola mola. I don't know if you guys know mola sunfish, washed up dead on the beach. They're all excited about it. And so they posted it to iNaturalist. And there, is a, there are a couple of these ocean sunfish, and there is one that lives commonly along the, not common, but you know, you would see it around California. But um, these researchers in Australia, so this guy, R. Foster, who's a fish guy in, in Melbourne, he's a scientist in a museum, he's like, whoa, wait a minute, I think this is the hoodwinker mola, which is actually a, a weird, rare mola that occurs in Australia, but has never been known from the Northern Hemisphere. And then he actually put in contact, you know, he, he looped in his colleague, who was the person who actually described this species in Perth. And she goes, holy mola, you know, which <laughs> is kind of cool. But there was this back and forth. They got that group of school kids to go back out. And, you know, we really need a photo of, you know, the tail. We need a photo of the teeth. And there's this kind of back and forth interaction. And what, what's kind of neat about these discoveries is that the media has, you know, an endless appetite for these kind of weird animal stories. <laughs> so a lot of these, you know, kind of go all over, the, you know, like weird sea creature washed up. But a lot of these kind of come from sort of just funny little interactions on INET. I had to add this third one this morning just because this happened uh, last week. But uh, this is a guy who, who was in Colombia. And I think, it was, I think my understanding of it, he was in a cabin or something in Colombia. And this weasel comes into his bathroom, runs around, he takes these photos of it on his toilet. And it turns out this is the first ever photos of this species of Colombian weasel. I'm not kidding. This thing is known from like three dead specimens. But he got all these photos of it as a paper just came out. But we had a toilet weasel was trending on Twitter, <laughs> which is pretty cool. <laughs> So, but again, these, these are kind of fun stories, but what's really neat are not the individual stories. It's this picture, this whole big scale picture we can get of the environment from bringing all these individual observations together. And that's what we're really trying to do is can we come up with a system to scale this? So right now, United Naturalist has 1.5 million um, registered users, but like any social network, it has that long tail thing where we have lots and lots of people who maybe use the app once, but then we have this core community of expertise where this is really their number one hobby. You know, these are people who, spend all their time kind of like either observing and listing or identifying other people or just you know living and dwelling on iNaturalist like it's Reddit or Facebook or Instagram or whatever a lot of other people use. Um, and it's a global site, but we definitely have a concentration in um, places like North America and um, the former colonies of England, like Australia and South Africa, a lot in Europe. You know, in, in Asia, it's sort of Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong. <laughs> Um, Singapore, but you know we're not not very big in mainland China, um, and we've been doubling every year since we started. So we started this effort in 2008, and it's been a very slow sort of doubling. Um, but we also have this very seasonal pattern because I think there's just more land and more activity in the northern hemisphere. So generally, we have a, kind of a spring bump and then a, a winter kind of trough. You know, when most of Europe and North America is covered in snow. And we just, for some reason, April is our biggest month always. Um, I think it's because people are kind of spring fever, cabin fever, and they come out and want to get, go on a lot of hikes. So we just had our, uh, our probably our peak for the year was April last week, last, last year, last month. And we got over 3 million photos. So it's pretty cool. We're definitely getting to the point where we're getting enough data to do really interesting things. Um, but again, we don't just want photos of, you know, the 13th millionth photo of a robin. We want to try to get data on diverse organisms, right? So this is, try to walk through these graphs. The second, so this first graph is just the growth in photos, right? But the second graph is on the x-axis is the number of species. 
So remember, I said there's, we think there's two million, we know there's two million named species. So these are species with names. We think there's probably more like 10 million out there, but they haven't even been given names. But two million, you know, we know that there, there's about a million insects, there's 300,000 plants, there's like 10,000 birds. Um, we have about 215,000 species where we have at least one photo, right? But it's a very skewed distribution. You know, there's some species here on the, um, you know, the lower down on the x-axis where we have 100,000 photos. So that's probably like American robin. We've got 100,000 photos of American robin. But then there's a lot of these species where we only have one photo, right? So I've just sort of arbitrarily drawn a line at 100 photos because that's maybe a useful number to start doing some machine learning type things. And we have about uh, 25,000 species where we have at least 100 photos. And what's kind of cool is that's also been growing non-linearly over time. So five years ago, we had 5,000 species where we had kind of 100 data points to start doing interesting things with. And now we have about 25,000. So that's our goal is can we actually grow this thing and this expertise to do interesting things, which I'll talk about in a second, with every species in the world, which would be about 2 million. Um, so a lot of this comes to scaling. <clears throat> but when we started this thing, you know, we weren't so interested in the photos, which I'll talk about in a second with all the computer vision machine learning. We were really interested in the points in the map. And there's a huge history of this in the environmental sciences, um, going back to the time of Linnaeus. This is um, something called GBIF, is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And the mission of GBIF was to get all these museums to open up their drawers, take out all these specimens that they've been collected over the millennia, digitize them, so you actually have a point on a map that then um, can be used to do analyses. So if you go to GBIF and you search for this um, Wimbrel, you'll actually get this, this one specimen here, I have a picture of it, that was collected by Charles Darwin on the voyage of the Beagle. So this is when Charles Darwin went around you know, the world and they stopped in the Galapagos and they collected this, um, this bird and you can get that data point. And GBIF now has about a billion records, which is pretty cool. But um, increasingly, that data is coming from citizen science. So there's a lot of bird citizen science things like eBird, which are creating huge amounts of data. If you take out birds though, 90% of the data from North America came from my naturalist last year for this sort of GBIF style data. So citizen science really is what's driving this kind of data collection. And the points on a map are so useful because they allow us to do things like this. So this is, um, this is a species distribution model. So the idea is that you can take all these points on a map and sort of correlate them with environmental characteristics and say, okay, this is where we think the species lives. And then if we think temperature is gonna right, right, raise the degrees or something's gonna happen, this is what's gonna happen to the species. So this um, little bunny thing here is called the American pika. And it's a little critter that only lives kind of above the tree line on the very tops of mountains. So you can see them um, the Sierras and the Rocky Mountains. And they used to, so we're in the, something called the Great Basin now, which is the sort of deserts between the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada. There used to be pikas on every mountain here. And if you kind of saw, I saw flying in here from San Francisco, these little snowy mountaintops. But we've lost in the last 10 years pika from pretty much every mountain in this Great Basin area, which is pretty, pretty amazing. And that's because as the climate warms, these guys just pop off the top. So these points on a map are really critical for understanding you know, where these species are. Um, let me try to Bob over here, see if this works. Okay, so this is um, not just in space, but also in time. This is monarch butterfly. So you guys all know what a monarch butterfly, I don't have a photo of it, but it's a charismatic orange butterfly that we see all over the place. And it's in the news a lot because it feeds on milkweed and a lot of the agricultural practices are changing in such a way that we're losing milkweed. So we're losing a lot of these monarchs. But one of the things that's kind of interesting about these monarchs is they do this very charismatic migration so um, you know, in the summer, you see them up there in July, all in North America. But then in the winter, you know, there's these famous mountains in Mexico where, I don't know if you've seen video of this, where there's just monarch butterflies roosting in the trees by the millions. And you know, the, the California coast has this too in Pacific Grove. But you know, we can start seeing for the first time you know, where these species are, not just you know, at a snapshot, but throughout their entire life histories, throughout the year, seasonally, and also from year to year, and start seeing these things decline. And this is all coming because we're able to get these points on a map, which in many ways are very traditional museum data that we've been collecting for hundreds of years, but we're able to get the stuff at huge scales that we've never seen before. Um, and this is, oops, get back over to my, um, and this is ultimately what, what our ambitions are to do with this is to be able to look not just within a year, but across years. This was something that from my naturalist a couple years ago that was really neat which is that uh, there's things called nudibranchs or sea slugs. They're, I don't know if you guys know what sea slugs are, but they're these, they call them the, the butterflies of the tide pools because they're these very beautiful little colorful slugs. And this pink one that looks like a little gob of bubble gum, it used to be almost completely absent from California. And then all of a sudden in 2014, it was the most common nudibranch of the tide pools. 
And this is something that would have gone completely under the radar, but we had enough citizen scientists, people out taking photos of these things, and actually be able to statistically see that these things are increasing. And again, this is the kind of stuff that fits exactly with this narrative that we hear, you know, climate change is happening, the oceans are getting warmer, species are moving up the coast, but we're just not, we don't have a handle on it. So we can, again, the, the ambition here is to be able to really get a sense for how species are changing in space and time over years, all from the citizen science data. But what's kind of neat is, again, at this point, we were only thinking of the photo as really evidence, kind of like that museum specimen. So in this, this uh, ladybug example, you know, if this person says it's that ladybug and that person says it's that ladybug, the photo is just proof, right? It's the evidence that they can share to make decisions about. But um, a couple years ago, we met um, a, a PhD student at Caltech who worked for Pietro Perona, who's now very involved with Ground Truth. Um, and uh, he's a computer, he's now working, he's now an Amazon researcher. But he sort of said, you know, these photos in themselves are very interesting thing. And there's all sorts of information in these photos that we have tools now that you can get at. And this is interesting. And, and so the first thing he, he said is, you know, just getting access, just getting this data out there to the machine learning communities is really interesting. Because we were sort of really focused on getting those points on the map out to the environmental community. He said, you know, the machine learning community is very interested in these photos. And it's kind of cool that, um, that GBIF data set I, I mentioned, 96% uh, of the photos from this last year and 90 from 2018 are from iNaturalist. So we seem to be the only effort that's really producing labeled photographs at scale. So he started organizing these um, uh, fine grain visual competition sort of challenges at the um, CVPR uh, conferences the last two years, which was just great. But we, we started making a lot of connections with researchers and Amazon researchers. And one of the first things we did with iNaturalist is just get a model into the system so that now when you upload an, an image to iNaturalist, you don't have to wait for the community to start chiming in. It immediately looks at this image and says, oh, we think it's this kind of beetle, which is kind of cool. Um, but also what I think is really neat is that in addition to this, what I'm focused on is a sort of species recognition problem, identifying these species, because that's core to the whole iNaturalist system working. We're really undergoing a renaissance right now where there's all sorts of interesting basic science that's coming from looking for patterns in these images for ecology. Um, here's an example where this is a group that took all these images from my naturalist of, of mountain goats. And apparently these mountain goats, sh they shed, the pattern of their fur shedding over time is correlated with climate change. So if they have like a hot early spring, they'll shed all at once. And if it's colder, you know, it sheds. So their shedding patterns are getting all screwed up by climate change. And so they took all these images from my naturalist and they trained a machine learning model not to identify mountain goats, but to identify these patterns of molting and correlate with that with, with, with what's happening in climate change. And this is another paper that came out this year. It's doing similar things with the color of, of wings on dragonflies. So I guess the, the species of dragonflies, some of them have dark wings and some of them have light wings. And they were able to say that the dark wings are actually associated with warmer temperatures. And you can not only see that gradient across warmer temperature areas, but as temperatures are warming, they're able to, they're, they're turning darker as well. So again, sort of basic research, but the, the, the job in both of these was just to get a bunch of images from my naturalist and train a model. But this really reminds me to what happened in like the 1980s with uh, genetics, is that all of a sudden we had these PCR techniques to get genes out of these specimens that have been sitting in museums, and then the analysis techniques to actually analyze genes. And there was this huge renaissance in interesting research. And I really feel like the same thing's happening in ecology with, com with computer vision right now, where we now have access to this data, which is photos from my naturalist, things like that, to actually, just like access to the DNA. And we have these machine learning tools to interpret this and start seeing things. So I, I expect that we'll see a whole lot of just really interesting basic science coming out from sort of this phenotypic, not genotypic revolution coming with, um, with photos. Um, but back to the problem that we're kind of focused on. So we have two kind of main apps with our naturalist, and I'll demo the second one. The first is kind of our workhorse app, which is really geared at the naturalist community. So these are the citizen scientists who are out there doing all this work. And we have to be careful with it because we don't want to sort of be like, we're replacing you. So the way we phrase it, this is the A, the one on the, on the left, with our naturals, we, we phrase it as suggestions. You know, these are suggestions. We think that it might be these species, but you know, you, you know this stuff, you're a naturalist. But we have the second app, which is Seek, which I'll demo in a second. And that's really geared more at an amateur audience and trying to sort of engage people who might not already associate with, with naturalists. And, um, and I'll demo that in a second, but they're kind of different, different audiences. But uh, we have problems with both of these is that our data set's getting so big. It's, there's a couple of these, I think this really models a couple kind of classic problems with computer, computer vision problems, which is what is this sort of open-ended, open, open world problem. You know, 
like I said, we know there's 2 million species, there's probably 10, but we only have data on 200,000, so we don't have a constrained data set. You know, we're getting, and we're also getting, we're continually learning. Every month we're getting millions of new images. So it's difficult to come up with a computer vision system that can kind of accommodate this new information. We also have this taxonomic situation where um, you know, we can't identify every species, every animal to species from a photo, but maybe we can give you the genus or the family. So there's a lot of interesting problems with this. And the way we're sort of working on this with, with colleagues at Amazon right now is most computer vision problems, they sort of have an evaluation protocol. Like this is how we're gonna evaluate the model. They have a data set, so that would either be like ImageNet or in this iNaturalist world, like this uh, CVPR challenge data set. And those are sort of fixed. We know we're going to evaluate them this way. We know we're going to um, you know, use this data set. And most of the innovation and the iteration comes on the model. How are we going to make this model better? What we're trying to do here is say, actually, let's hold the, the evaluation protocol on the model sta static. You know, we'll just use the best model out there from you guys. <laughs> and you know, uh, we'll, we'll understand our evaluation protocol. But let's figure out how to turn this kind of living, breathing, iNaturalist database into a data set, right? And, and do that so we can get around this problem that is growing all the time, that it's open-ended, that it's super skewed, where we've got a gazillion photos of robins and we only have three photos of this other species. And also the cost associated with this. I mean, we're, we're a natural history museum and a National Geographic Society. We're not, um, our server costs and our storage costs have been sort of steadily climbing, but that model train cost, this is our last model train. You know, it was just a couple, a couple weeks of training and it was you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So again, for us, we need to come up with a, a way of of figuring out how to turn this database into a data set to train high quality models, but also do so efficiently for all these different reasons. So that's really the, the problem that we're working on right now. Um, but the last thing I want to do is just kind of demo seek, and um, uh, which here, let me see if I can slip this over here. You get into live demo territory here. Cool. Uh oh. Um, so this obviously works a lot better when uh, we're outside. So this app is designed to work outside on a hike, but I'll do the next th best thing here, I have a field guide. So, <laughs> so this is a Seek app. So the thing we realized with, with Seek is that iNaturalist was kind of preaching to the choir, right? It's sort of, the, it's, like a, it's like Strava for runners. Strava is a great app if you're an athlete and you want to track your run and you want to do it and compete, but it's pretty hard to get your mom using Strava or your friend using Strava. And we had the same problem with iNaturalist. It's kind of like, you know, you have to be really into nature and really into, being a citizen scientist to find a natural appealing. So the Seek app is, is supposed to be kind of a gateway drug. We want it to be just super, super simple. It's kind of gamey. It's got challenges and things. And hopefully if people are interested, there's ways that you can kind of sign up and move into the iNaturals whole world, which gets very nerdy very quickly. So that's the kind of goal. But what was kind of neat, again, back to the computer vision modeling thing here, is we wanted to have a really, um, a way of actually using computer vision to teach people how to become better naturalists and better photos, so better, um, better photographers. One of the problems we have with our naturalists is people take a picture of a bug you know, from five feet away and it's a little speck. So this model now is small enough that it's actually running on the device, so it's not taking a picture, sending it up to the cloud and getting it classified. So you can see there that um, that says barred owl right there. So if I, let me get back over there, barred owl. Oops, oops. Um, identify the photo. So then and I got a little badge, but then uh, <laughs> oops, I screwed that up. But let me um, just go back here though. But what's kind of cool is so that again, you know, the idea is that someone might be here and it just says birds and then they get a little closer and you know, wood owls and then they get kind of close enough and they sort of inspect the thing and then it gets to barn owl, right? So it's kind of cool. And the other thing is you have painted bunting. Let's try a couple of these. All right, having trouble focusing. Let's see if I can get this a better angle. Um, pipe vine swallowtail. Let me flip through this and see if I can find, because um, one thing that's, oh, here's a good example. So this is um, blue jay, which is a very unique species. Nothing really looks like this, but this is a genus of jays. This is the western scrub jay, but there's a couple that look similar. So see this has perching birds, and then if I get closer, it's jays, and then if I get really close, I can probably get this to genus, but it's not going to get it to species. And that's another thing that I think is interesting is, remember, we're a scientific effort here. We really want to be right. It would be really bad if we said that this was the wrong bird. And a lot of these sort of image recognition apps that you're seeing on the App Store right now, they're just wrong a lot. So we're trying to use the taxonomy to be, you know, to sacrifice precision for accuracy. If we can't be accurate, then we'll be less precise. So we can use the sort of taxonomic tree to do that. Um, but anyway, this is, you know, this is a Texas field guide. And I think iNaturalist works pretty well 
kind of throughout the uh, North America and Europe. But if you were to use this in a Colombian rainforest, it would probably be pretty bad right now. I wouldn't get that Colombian weasel. So that's the ambition here, right? Can we grow this whole machine and human uh, team system big enough so that we can, uh, we can do things like that, where you could get dropped down into the middle of a Colombian rainforest and actually identify these things and, and help track these things. So I know I focus a little bit more on the kind of computer vision research, but you know, a huge part why naturalists works, and the main part, and long before we got into computer vision, was this whole social network, this crowdsourcing community. And you know, we took us, we've been at this since 2008, sort of slowly growing this community. But for a lot of these efforts, people just don't have access to that kind of community of labor, labelers, and that's what the ground truth thing is really all about. So I'm gonna turn it over to Federer, who's gonna talk about uh, ground truth is really a way of, of, of doing that work. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Fedor. I'm a scientist in Amazon. And uh, Scott just gave some absolutely fascinating uh, talk about, uh, um, about this wonderful community of people who identify species in, 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 the, in the wild and then you know, take pictures of those species. And what if, you are, what if you're a business who doesn't have the access to this such a great community and you have a variety of images and, and you want to at least understand what's in those images and somehow label them. So this is where Amazon can, can help you start with this, with this journey. And uh, I'm gonna talk today about Amazon SageMaker Ground Truth. Uh, this is a system which allows um, you to label a data at scale. And uh, I'm gonna describe how you can use it and, and how you can start and what, can, what it can do. Oh, first, um, very quick, quick walk through, through, the, through the benefits of using the system. One is that because it's an AWS, it's part of the AWS SageMaker, it actually come, uh, comes uh, to you with the integrated SageMaker uh, flow of labeling, deploy, labeling uh, data, building your model on that data, training your data, uh, training your model, and deploying that model. Well, we also have some algorithms inside SageMaker Ground Truth, uh, which produce more accurate annotations by leveraging consensus of uh, annotators. Um, moreover, we run active learning with, within the labeling, uh, within your labeling job, which possibly um, for quite a lot of data sets can allow you to save on the annotations. Um, we have some set of predefined curated UIs, which are very convenient for the annotators to use if you uh, say don't have um, UI specialists on board and, and want to label your data. Uh, as well as we, um, one of our workforce types, which I'm going to talk more about, is um, Mechanical Turk. And uh, we curate the Mechanical Turk workforce so, workforce so that when you label your data, you know, you're going to get only the annotators who are uh, going to do, hopefully, a good job um, on your labeling tasks. So as I mentioned, um, AWS SageMaker, Amazon SageMaker Ground Truth is part of AWS SageMaker, and uh, we have this integrated flow from labeling um, data. So when you have a lot of images or a lot of text, and you don't have labels on those, the first thing you need to do is to actually label them, and this is where uh, Ground Truth comes in. And then after you label the data, you launch SageMaker Notebook. And SageMaker Notebook allows you to explore the data, the label data you have, understand whether um, you have some outliers on the data and maybe build the model, actually figure out some architecture of the deep learning network, which you want to train on that data. And then after you decided that, okay, this is going to be my architecture, these are going to be my hyperparameters for my um, network, I'm going to train. And so there's a SageMaker training component. We actually uh, take your model and so you train, and then the SageMaker training allocates a machine with a GPU if you want, or with multiple GPUs on it, or even multiple machines on it, and then goes and trains your model on... Um, uh, on the data that you provide to it. As well as when the model is trained, what you want to do, hopefully, is that you want that model to actually bring value to you by inferring on the new images or new data which uh, the model hasn't seen before. Now, so this is the inference part, where you take the model, you uh, say, host that model for inference, and the model is getting into the, um, uh, into the cloud on the, on the machine uh, for inference, and then you can call um, that uh, that machine for actually inferring on your on your images. So let's see what what can uh, what are the use cases the SageMaker um, uh, Ground Truth can um, can help you with. 
Well, we have uh, five use cases right now. Uh, image classification, bounding box semantic segmentation, text classification, and uh, custom, UI, custom tasks. Image classification is when you have a collection of images, and for every image, you want to say, is that a cat or is that a dog? Is that a crow or is that a parrot? For bounty boxes where you have, you have a, an image and then you want to find where is the object of interest on that image. For example, um, in this example is two birds. Where, where are those birds on the images? The semantic segmentation is a little more elaborate case where for every pixel of the image you're trying to say, is this a pixel of a person or is this a pixel of a car? And so all of the people are going to be colored, say, in red because these are pixels of, of people, and then um, some of the uh, all of the, uh, the pixels of, of uh, cars uh, will be co uh, colored in, in, say, blue. And as a result, uh, you you have this very careful segmentation of an image, uh, which is often used in, um, say, autonomous driving uh, use cases. Uh, there is a text classification use case. We have a collection of, say, customer reviews or news stories. You want to understand the sentiment. Maybe it's positive, negative, or or, or neutral. Um, for that collection of text. And the custom tasks is something that if, if none of the four use cases suit your, um, if none of the four um, labeling use cases suit your, your task, you can um, bring your own UI and just label with your own UI. Also, we have some predefined UIs in the custom tasks, which um, allow you to uh, label data with whatever, whatever type or whatever way you want to uh, label it. So what are the key ideas, key machine learning ideas behind uh, the service? Well, one of the ideas, as I mentioned, is um, actually gathering insight from multiple annotators so that you have a better answer and, and hopefully more accurate answer um, because a majority is better than, say, a random, a single, even sometimes expert. Another idea which is, is that you can actually train a model which maybe might not be good enough for all of your images or for all of your data, but might be good for some of them. And it can actually identify that, oh, well, I can label some parts of these. Like, I can label black cats. I know that the black cats are very easy to identify, and so I can label those, but for the other cats, I don't really know much. And so we have this loop where the model is getting trained and tries to understand, and then it's, it's um, uh, for the hard uh, examples, they are being sent to uh, the human labelers. That can allow you, might allow you to, to reduce the annotation costs. So this is a little bit more detailed flow of how it works, is, is you have an input data set, and uh, as you can see, it's unlabeled. There is no boxes around those, around those birds. And then uh, the active learning kicks in. And active learning is this process which says, what is the data that my model doesn't know about? What is this data that uh, is going to be really useful for the model to know the label of so that it can learn faster? And this process uh, says, okay, well, these are the images, so I'm going to send them to humans. And so it sends them to human, uh, human label for human labeling, and then uh, human annotators annotated, and we do this label consolidation. And uh, finally, the uh, annotated images are going to go to the label data set as a result. Another part of this process is that the active learning also identifies with auto-labeling, what can I label well? So it, it calls the machine learning model and says, what do you already know? Can you label some of the images fairly reliably, quite with high accuracy. And then the model, if it's already decent, if it's already good enough, it can label some of the images with very high accuracy, and those are also getting, at the end, into the labeled data set. Finally, for the custom UIs, um, this is an example of an instant segmentation uh, workflow. An instant segmentation is different from semantic segmentation by the fact that not all of the cats are colored in the same color. So basically, for every cat in this color, in this image, or for every dog, you actually have a new color. But as you can see on the, on the right of the image, um, all of the cats are actually identified as cats, all of the dogs are identified as dogs. So this is an example of a custom workflow um, you can use in our system for um, to obtain a the annotations for instance segmentation. So let's um, go a little bit through how you actually would use ground truth, how would you would start using it. Well, the first very important decision you need to make for uh, when, you, when you start using it is what workforce you're going to use. And so we have the choice of three labeling workforces. The public workforce is Mechanical Turks. It has about half a million independent contractors worldwide. And they work 24-7. They're, they're in various parts of the world, you know, India and, and Russia and uh, United States. And um, you probably are going to get fairly fast annotations from that, uh, from that workforce. 
Uh, another type of a workforce is private workforce. So private workforce is somebody that you identify to label your data. It can be yourself or it can be your coworkers. You just take their emails, uh, make, a, um, uh, make a collection of uh, people as a, as a workforce, and then uh, they are going to get on the email the link where they can go to and label the data, as well as you can collaborate with some contractors who can label the data. We also have a, a curated set of vendors, which is the third wor workforce option. And vendors are companies which actually specialize on labeling data, and you can use them uh, to uh, label your data um, uh, with potentially uh, good accuracy uh, if you don't have some labelers on site. Also, how do you how do you start using Grunt Truth? Well, the way you do it is you go to AWS console and. Um, for those of you who don't use AWS yet, you should. Uh, it, it's a great, uh, it's a great ecosystem of various components. But uh, when you go to the uh, to the AWS console, you go to AWS SageMaker, Amazon SageMaker, and then there's this labeling part. As as as, as I told you before, we have this labeling um, uh, notebook training and inference. And so if you go to labeling and and you go to the labeling jobs. Then you can actually create a labeling job. What, so what's what's good about this integration with AWS is that if you have some data stored on S3, for example, then you don't need to actually do anything to transfer this data anywhere to start labeling it. As well as you also have the SageMaker, um, and therefore you have the models as some collection of pre-built algorithms for you and the training and hosting, which I mentioned before. And they're all integrated within the same console um, for, uh, for the convenience. So when you create a labeling job, um, there is um, job details that you need to specify. The first job detail is a job name. It has to be unique. And then the second detail is, is uh, actually a collection of images or text that you want to label. That's called a manifest. And manifest is basically a file. For every line of that file, it points to an image uh, or a text which you want to label. Then there's an output manif output um, location, which is an S3 location uh, where your labels are going to go, as well as some um, permissions uh, permissions of the job. And as I mentioned, you can choose out of the five uh, labeling tasks right now. On the second step, when you click next, you're going to see uh, what workforce you want to use for your um, for your data. And when you choose a workforce, if you choose a public workforce, you'll need to consent that the, uh, your images are going to be public and they they're don't have uh, don't contain adult content, uh, and they can be released to the public. As well as you can choose vendor and private. So one of the things which which is is important to understand when, when you're choosing this uh, this part of a um, uh, uh, when you're choosing the workforce type is is how you're going to pay for that workforce. So for the Mechanical Turk, currently you pay per image. For vendor, uh, for vendors, you pay uh, in, uh, in in per time. So if, if the vendor took say one hour, then you pay um, depending on various vendors a uh, certain amount of money per hour for uh, labeling that. And private workforce, if it's your coworkers, you pay in in, in beer or, or cheers or whatever uh, whatever way um, you agree with them. And then uh, in the additional configuration, you actually select how many. Uh, annotators you want to annotate your data, as well as whether you want to use active labeling or not. So um, here's the additional options, and here's the additional options on the on the left, on the right side of the screen. And then in the uh, in the bottom of this image, as you can see, there's this tool which allows you to actually create instructions. And this is super important to create good instructions. I'm going to go um, about this later, talk about uh, this uh, uh, later in a couple of slides, but. Uh, you can see how the instructions are going to look for your annotators, as well as put some images there, and so that the um, task is created uh, in a convenient and clear way. So when you launch there, that's uh, that's it. So these these two um, these two with these two steps, you can uh, create a labeling job, and it's going to run. And you'll see that you have a labeling job name, and it's going to be in progress. It's going to show you how many uh, objects you've already annotated so far. And um, by clicking on uh, one of those. Um, uh, so uh, by clicking on one of those jobs, you're actually going to see parts, some of the objects which are going to be annotated. So this is how the annotation looks to the annotator. The annotation UI looks for the annotator, and as you can see on the left of this image, there is instructions, and the instructions are basically a crucial part for obtaining good quality. 
It's best to have visual instructions which have clearly good examples, some clear um, bad examples, uh, with, with hopefully not, as, as not a lot of text um, and a lot of very visual clear um, um, task uh, in front of the annotators. And if your task is really complex, for example, you want to identify a deep hierarchy of bird species, that it might be easier to actually split that task into various uh, parts um, and various labeling jobs. And as you can see, that we have we have this dog, and so that the person can on the bottom, uh, the person can choose what um, type of the labeling, uh, what type of a uh, uh, labeling tool they want to use. So for this one is, is a bounty box task, so they can draw a bounty box, or they can delete that bounty box. And uh, there's a little bit more controls for the person. And then on the right, I see the submit button. And where they submit, uh, the annotation actually goes into the ground truth system. And it's being consolidated with the, the other annotations. So when, when the job is finished, uh, you'll see that the job is completed. You'll see where the images are going to go. Uh, you'll see, you'll s you'll see uh, where, the, where the manifest was. As well as you will actually see the thumbnails of the, of the images uh, with the, for example, in this case, it's a bounty box job, so you'll actually see the bounty boxes around them. And uh, as you can see, like we, we had a, we had a task of identifying dogs in the pictures, and then some of these pictures have birds, and the annotators correctly found uh, correctly figured out that the birds are not dogs, so you don't have um, you don't have boxes around the around the birds. So let's uh, get a little bit deeper right now and and figure out what happens in the background of the system. So as I mentioned, let's, let's uh, recall that we have this input data set. And this input data set is getting the active learning part and the auto-labeling um, machine learning models. And uh, uh, these machine learning models label part of your data. And then as well as human labelers uh, um, uh, label some other part of the data uh, with the consolidation, the results are going to get into the label data set. And so I'm going to talk about the label consolidation now and about the active learning auto-labeling part. So first, let's, let's ask the question, why do we even need cons to consolidate the annotations? Well, let, let's take an example of this uh, image of a bird. And, the three an and we'll launch this image to the three annotators and we say, well, what kind of a bird is it? Well, it, it turns out that two of the annotators can say, well, maybe that's a sparrow. And one of the annotators says, oh, well, that's a pigeon. And if you just send this image to a single annotator, What's probably going to happen is that in two of cases out of the three, uh, you're going to you know, get sparrow. And one of the cases out of the three, you're going to get pigeon. And uh, your data set is going to be only 66% correct in this case. So instead, if you actually send this image to all of the three annotators and consolidate this, this with, say, majority vote, then you're going to get the, a better answer. Um, however, one of the interesting things about majority voting is that it actually doesn't take into account anything about whether this person is good at identifying birds or whether that person is not good at, in identifying birds. So it's a very intuitive idea. If you think about this, that you know some people are just better in, in, in identifying birds because they are part of the, say, a naturalist community, and, and they, this is what they, they spend their time on, and, and uh, uh, they really like this. And you can build this trust score in the background, and you can say you know some of the annotators have uh, better trust score, and some of the entities have, have fewer task, uh, trust score. And you don't really need to say, OK, well, these entities just don't know anything. But even just having this, this continuous information about the annotators, some of them are better than others, that can potentially help you with uh, obtaining better labels, better final uh, consolidation result. So in this uh, more complex example, uh, we have an image, which we send to five annotators. And then we are asking, OK, well, what are the birds on this image? And uh, the annotators, well, two of the annotators say that's a canary, and two of the annotators say that's a parrot, and one of the annotators says, well, that's probably a woodpecker. And you're trying to figure out, OK, so if you're just using the majority voting, what's going to happen? Well, in one of the, in uh, one of, basically in 50% of the cases, if you flip a coin, if you don't know which, which, of, the which of the canary or parrot you're going to use, then you're going to choose the wrong annotation result. However, if you actually have some sort of trust in the annotators, what you can do is you can weigh these results in a better way. And as you can see in this case, the last annotator is, is just a specialist in identifying parrots versus canaries. And, and uh, they have a weight of 0 0.9 historically. And so let's just trust this annotator more, and let's uh, trust some other annotators less. 
And as a result, the weight of the parrot as, uh, in the resulting system is going to be higher, and you're going to identify that these are indeed the parrots. So we have this David Skeen, it's actually a modification of the um, published David Skeen algorithm, which builds the uh, probabilities of uh, the probabilities that the annotators are correct, and then it then applies those probabilities uh, to um, to make a better, more reliable, and consolidated result. Well, now let's move into the active learning part. Uh, well, the active learning is is this process, um, which, as I mentioned, identifies what images the model cannot uh, label uh, by itself, and therefore some of the images which are going to be the most beneficial for the model to train on. I mean, you have a collection of images, and then you have a, a, a deep learning model, which is being trained on maybe these images or maybe some other images, but, but, but can also know, let's say you have a collection of birds, and you, want, we're gonna, you want to identify what bird it is, and you have a, a deep learning model which might not be very precise for your data set, and uh, what it's doing is that it can actually label um, for every single image, it can not only label, say, that's a, that's a parrot or that's a canary, it can tell you a confidence. And so for every object in your unlabeled data set, it can tell you the confidence of how confident this model is that that's a parrot, and how confident this model is in that that's a canary. And what happens with the active learning process, one of the most uh, straightforward algorithms for active learning is to say, well, the images where the bird is really unconfident, the images where the bird, oh, sorry, <laughs> the images where the model is really unconfident, those, those birds, the model doesn't really know much, so let's send them to the human annotators. And when this happens, you get the training labels, and after you get this new set of training labels, you can retrain the model. And so this loop can improve the model over time. Um, when the model is somewhat improved over time, one of the ideas which is present again in uh, SageMaker Ground Truth is auto-labeling. Um, what we do is that we're trying to identify how can a model predict reliably what bird, uh, what bird is on the image. And uh, we, don't, we don't have this process where the model trains to a certain level and now it's accurate and now we're just using it. This is the normal usual process of training and inference which I described before. So instead, we're actually trying to identify what subset of the images the, bird, uh, the model knows about and what subset of the images it doesn't know about. And, and the way to do that is that we first select some sort of a set of validation images. So those are human-labeled images, which are representative of your data set, where the model can check itself. And we take this model and we apply it on the validation images. And we say, okay, well, uh, the confidences of the model for the validation set, some of them are high and some of them are low. And let's rank all of the uh, all of the objects, all of the images by confidence. And for the high confidence, uh, for the high confidence images, how precise are we? So let's say the model is ninety percent confident in ten images. How precise are we for all of those images with with more than ninety percent confidence? And we can do that by looking at the validation data set because human la human labels already labeled all of those images, so we know the true answer. And so therefore, we are actually finding a threshold with which your model can predict well and can predict accurately. So on the validation data set, um, this, this threshold is found and then it can be applied on the unlabeled images. So, so what we do, of course, after that is we take the same model and we rank all of the unlabeled images by confidence. And now we can say, well, we found out on the validation data set that the model can be 98% accurate if its confidence is higher than, say, 83. And so then we can take this confidence of 83 and apply it on the unlabeled images, and it's expected to be 98% accurate on all of the unlabeled images. So those images can be put uh, in the labeled data set, and you can use them afterwards, and you can be fairly sure that they are, they are quite accurate in comparison with, uh, quite accurate and almost, almost as good as human labors. This way you can potentially save on the annotations on the easy examples, and that's actually what I'm going to describe in this, uh, in this slide. So this slide describes um, a proceeding of a labeling job. That labeling job had 1,000 images. So we collected 1,000 images, 
And uh, this labeling job is described in the blog post, so if you want to read a little bit more in details, uh, then there's a link on the bottom of the blog post. But what happens is that the first, the, so how do you label 1,000 images? Well, you first split it in batches, and first the, the, model send, uh, the system sends 10 images for annotation. The reason it sends 10 images for annotation is just to check that everything works. The annotators can see your images, they can annotate, your tool works, your images are reasonable, they're not you know, too large or too small, and so it sends and it checks that they're suitable for annotation. And so as you can see, we, on the first iteration, we label 10 images. The second iteration says, okay, well, now we know that our, our whole pipeline works. Let's label the first set, which is actually the validation set I mentioned to you before. So this is, this is a moment where we select this representative data set out of your data set, su representative subset, and we label it with humans. So on the second iteration, you see we selected 200 images out of 1,000, and uh, we labeled them with humans. So um, on this graph, you can see that the light brown bar says that there's 200 images and it's labeled with humans. 200 images labeled with humans. And what's also interesting about this graph is it shows you how many boxes are on those images. So th this was a birds data set and we can see that there is about 400 boxes, which basically means that there is two birds per image. Approximately in, in your data set you have two birds per image. So it's a dark brown bar on the second, the second part, second iteration. So you've labeled 200 images and about two birds per image. On the third iteration, we're saying, well, the model, we don't have a model yet. Like, you know, we just have a validation data set. Training on validation data set is not good because then you're gonna reinforce, just reinforce itself and be overly confident. So let's have a, the next batch again for training. So we again take the 200 uh, data points, we send them for human annotation, and uh, we label, but these, these points are going to be labeled, uh, are going to be labeled for training the model. And as you can see, these are also random, this is also random selection. As you can see, there's about 200 data points, and there is about two birds per, um, per image. So it's um, approximately the same, maybe a little complex, but that's basically a random fluctuation. And after that, we've trained the first version of the model. So we have all of this active learning process now kicked in, and we're trying to auto-label some of the images. So let's see what happens on the fifth, on the iteration four. So on the iteration four, you see the blue bar start appearing. So the light blue is how many images were labeled by the model. And we can see that there is probably 20 images here. Yeah, about 20 images that were labeled by the model on the iteration four. But what's also interesting is that the darker blue, the darker blue bar here, um, so the, bar, the blue bar on the fourth iteration, it has about 20 images. And then the, the dark blue bar shows how many boxes are per image. And as you can see, the number of boxes is actually very close to the number of images. So the model chose to label only the images which probably have about one bird, not two birds. So those are probably simpler images than the, the images with, which have two birds. And uh, in, the, in the fourth iteration, we're saying, okay, well, we've auto-labeled as much as we could right now. The model doesn't know anything more about this. So we're gonna send more, annotate, more images to humans. And so we send again 200 images to humans, but the active learning process kicks in. So what does it do? It actually tries to identify now what images are going to be the most useful for the model to learn on. And so as you can see, on the fourth iteration, even though we sent about 200 images for, to, for human labeling, the amount of boxes for, uh, on those images is 700. So we actually get what, 3.5 birds per image rather than two birds per image. So the model identified the hard examples on the fourth iteration. Those, they identified the, the images, oh, there's a lot of birds here, so I'm totally gonna learn from it. And uh, of course, those images are human labeled. Uh, the process returns. And then on the fifth iteration, we have the success of the model where it labels almost everything, almost all of the rest of the data. You can see it labeled um, two, 400 images on, this, on the fifth iteration. And again, as you can see, the number of birds per image is smaller than average, right? So if it was about two birds, then it would be, this, this uh, column would be 800, but it's not. It's 520 or something along those lines. So, so the model still labeled only easy images, but uh, if you were to send all of them to the annotators, that would be more expensive. And that's actually where I'm coming to on the next graph. And this is the price breakdown. So as you can see, like on the first iteration, you have total price, cost in dollars for uh, labeling this data set. And then you have a second iteration, third iteration, cost in dollars. The fourth iteration, 
you have some cost for training the model. So every training costs SageMaker training, and you incur costs for hosting for um, training that um, model on a GPU. But the costs are significantly lower than the costs of sending these uh, easy images to humans. And on the fifth iteration, you have again the uh, training costs. But as a result of all of this job, you have a bill of $190 for labeling these 1,000 images. And if you send all of those images to humans, you would actually have a bill of $260, which basically saved you 27%. And this is a very small data set. So the, as you can probably, as you probably know, if you, if you read um, much about deep learning, like the deep learning requires a huge amount of data. And if you have a large data set to label, and preferably a lot of the images in that data set are easy, then you can expect to get quite uh, quite large, and uh, we, in our experiments, got much larger cost savings on, on uh, larger data sets. And if your data set is very hard, then your savings might not be as, as large, but um, at least you tried, and, uh, um, and you have a model in the background. Well, uh, that's it, and uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. And <laughs>